Hello, I'm from Learning Development. Uh, we're based in the library in Mile End, but we're not actually librarians. We're, if you like, an educational arm of, um, of the university. And our whole reason for being is to help to make things clearer for students and to help everybody to get to the next stage up because um, I often compare it to an Olympic uh, athlete that if you're going for bronze, then you're going for gold, then you're going for double gold, then we want to break your own record. So everybody is trying in all works, walks of life to be a little bit better and do a little bit better than they actually are. And so that's what we do. Uh, we help students in their work in that respect. Um, if you would like any information about us, you can find it on our website. Um, uh, we do have um, fully qualified uh, doctors uh, in maths who will uh, give work, help on statistics if you need it. Um, and we also have writing and study guidance for, for statistics. If you want it, you have to write in. Seems to have slipped. Okay, uh, I'm going to just explain a few very common terms uh, that you uh, people don't always use correctly. First of all, the source is the original place or person that your information comes from. Uh, to reference is simply to give the name of that source. A quotation is the exact words of the source without any change. A citation is a broader term. It can include direct quotations, but it can also be referring to your source in your own words um, and just giving the summarizing the main ideas of your source. A text is a body of writing which can vary in length from a paragraph to a complete book. And I'm putting my talk into a positive reframe if I can. The scary stuff about plagiarism is at the beginning. Uh, avoiding plagiarism is about what you mustn't do and it brings fear of penalties. Uh, but I prefer to talk about maintaining academic integrity, which uh, brings, it's about what you can do, and it brings hope of success and tells you how to achieve. Integrity is honesty, honesty of mind and soul, and working on good principles. A lot of people have plagiarism nightmares. They are so afraid of plagiarizing, but there is no need for that. If you um, really don't know what to do, there is plenty of help that you can get. Um, the word plagiarism actually is 2,000 years old. The first plagiarist was in ancient Rome and uh, a poet I love very much called Marshall, a Roman poet, uh, found this man Fidentius, Fidentinus standing in the marketplace reciting his books and pretending that Marshall's work was his own and of course the crowd would would throw money at him and it's not a very nice thing to do um, I, I, I mean if somebody has copied your work and is using it for commercial gain or even not if they haven't acknowledged I just imagine if you're writing your your PhD thesis or your dissertation and somebody publishes it and pretends it's theirs it's not a very nice thing to do and plagiarism it actually comes from the word plaga which means a net and it was used for kidnapping slaves. So uh, slaves and even children were kidnapped in this hunting net. So it's like, it, it, it's, it's like kidnapping, kidnapping somebody's work. A good definition of plagiarism would be literary theft, stealing somebody's work that isn't your own. And as the university defines it in their regulations, 
it's uh, presenting someone else's work as your own irrespective of intention whether you intended to do it or not if you're driving a car and you knock somebody over and kill them that person is dead even whether whether you intended to do it deliberately or if you did it by accident now if it's deliberate and some people do this not many but there are a few who do they copy or they buy an essay or they even hire a writer and uh, if they're caught doing this and some departments if they suspect it they will uh, interview people and if they're found guilty of hiring a writer well out they go no degree and no fees back if it's accidental uh, and sometimes people forget that they've read something somewhere else then there is a little bit more mercy shown but um, you still have to go through several interviews and resubmit so the answer to that is really keep a note of your sources as you go along every time you read or hear a good idea in a lecture and you want to think you might want to use it note down where it came from when you're doing your reading note down the sources then it will save you endless trouble later so what does the word plagiarism include Again, according to the university regulations, it's copying the work of another person, and that includes another student, copying their exact words. It's using the ideas and research findings of another person without proper acknowledgement, not just the words. It's really good. It will help your grades to use the ideas and research of other people, but you must say where it comes from. It's maintaining good principles of integrity. It can include close paraphrasing and here is where many students go wrong. It's good to paraphrase. Paraphrase means using your own words. But when you just slot one word in instead of another, that is not the same as summarizing, understanding the ideas and fitting them into the body of your own work. And I'll tell you more about that later. Um, Self-plagiarism, I don't think that this will apply, but it's in the regs, so I'll say it. It's repeating work that you yourself have previously submitted. Most blatant, it might be giving an essay for one course and then submitting it for another. Um, or it could be if you have written something else for another university. Sure, you can use parts of it, but you need to reference yourself and say where the information came from. As long as you say where it all comes from and reference properly, you won't go too far wrong. Now, why do people plagiarise? Well, I think very often because they have language problems and this includes native speakers. Uh, it's a very difficult skill to read a lot of different material, get the ideas together and summarise it. But whatever the language problem, don't ever copy and paste. It will always lead to trouble. Common problems are that it's difficult to summarise your own information in your own words in English. It's just difficult things to do. Sometimes people have insufficient vocabulary. This can affect their reading, it can slow their reading up, and also they think that they have to write in some kind of posh, sophisticated academic vocabulary. Well, learning academic vocabulary, if there is such a thing, is good, learning sophisticated vocabulary, but you have to really understand what the word means before you can use it. 
Uh, a lot of people are unsure what is expected of them when they do independent research in the UK, especially if you come from a culture where your degree, your first degree was done differently. Many, many, many students have never had to structure academic writing before. They've told me this in one-to-ones and they don't know how to go about it. But whatever the problem is, still don't copy and paste because it will be detected and even if it isn't, the style of the writer you've copied from will not be the same as your own. If you have these problems or even if you suspect you have, get help. Everybody's here to help and often it seems that you're thrown in the deep end of the swimming pool when you come to a British university and you're supposed to be independent. Well, you are, but the help is there. You just have to ask for it and seek it out because the attitude of the British is if you don't ask for help, we think you're all right. So we won't interfere, but you need to ask for help. Okay, now um, maybe many of you have heard of the dreaded Turnitin, have you? Anybody heard of Turnitin? Some. Okay, it's an electronic tracking system. And uh, this is actually from their website, which isn't a bad website. It's got a student blog on it. Now, Turnitin is a s very sophisticated software with a huge database. And on that database, when an essay goes in, it compares that essay with more than 12 billion pages of live and archived internet content. That's what's in its memory. So, if something was on the internet 10 years ago and isn't there anymore, it is still in the memory bank of Turnitin. It has 110 million live and archived student papers, so when your dissertation goes into Turnitin, it will be stored in Turnitin's memory bank. It has more than 80,000 professional, academic, commercial journals and publications in its memory bank. Now, it's got even more than that now because these figures were two years old. Now, if Turnitin has all that information in its memory bank and somebody has plagiarised, what do you think the chances are that Turnitin will match the material? I think they're pretty high. Can Turnitin detect plagiarism? Well, not really because... Turnitin is a machine, it's a tool. It only recognises matching material. So if somebody's name is Mary Smith and somebody else's name is Mary Smith, it will match it. That's not plagiarism, but Turnitin can't think it can only match. But your tutors can and your tutors and the people grading interprets the result of the originality report that Turnitin generates. I have to ask this, it doesn't feel I might. Um, am I, can you hear me okay, George? Okay. Um, originality reports can help tutors to locate potential sources of plagiarism, possible sources, and the tutor decides. And the submitted paper and the suspect sources are carefully checked by the person grading the work. Now, uh, we're going to look at this original text. This is a genuine example. Research over the past two decades has shed light on the complex pathology of spinal cord injury.
Spinal cord injury involves an initial mechanical or primary injury followed by a series of cellular and molecular secondary events which result in the progressive destruction of spinal cord tissues. Now we're going to look at the student's version and see if the student has plagiarised or not. Now the student has changed some of the words Instead of shed light on, the student has used elucidated, more information about. Instead of followed by, the student has used preceded by. And instead of results in, the student has used resulting in the gradual rather than the progressive. So there has been some paraphrase, if you like, and there is a reference given. Now please, if you think that student has plagiarised, raise your right hand. If you think the student has not plagiarised, raise your left hand. And if you don't know, wave at me with both hands. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, okay. Right, what a variety of responses. Well, the answer is that it's very difficult for a tutor to tell if the tutor has not got the original text in front of them. So this is what happens. The submission goes through Turnitin and the original text is undoubtedly on the database and the student that is what happens to the student's submission every time there is a match of either more than five or eight words it depends the, the, the tutor will set the filter then that is highlighted in red so this is actually quite worrying because the student has used the exact words of the original. Even though there is a reference, these are the exact words without quotation marks. And there's a long string of them. And what the student has done is try to fool Turnitin by changing a few words here and there. And we know the words aren't the student's own because elucidated and preceded have been misused by the student. This is a genuine example. The student's gone to a dictionary, maybe uh, an international dictionary, maybe a thesaurus, which are really wrong things to use, looked up shed light and found elucidated, think, chomp, I'm going to use that, and has misused the word. Uh, this is what's called a close paraphrase. The occasional word in the middle has been changed, but the whole body of the text has not been integrated into the student's writing. So, you use quotation marks for someone's exact words. A string of someone's exact words needs quotation marks, these, what we used to call inverted commas, and a reference. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. You don't need the quotation marks if you have summarised somebody's ideas and integrated it into the body of your writing. You do need the reference, but you don't need the quotation marks. So how long is a string of words? Well, as I say, it's usually five or eight the occasional string may be okay. It's when several strings occur together that the marker considers its plagiarism. And this is actually what this particular student submitted. As you can see, whole blocks of the text with just little words changed here and there to try and fool the machine. Now, I as a tutor, and I think any any 
uh, tutor supervise the grader of marks in a department, seeing that would immediately say this student has plagiarised because there are so many strings of words in red all together. It cannot be an accident, like repeating your name, Mary Smith. So the tutor sees that and says that's plagiarism. Now, I've rewritten it here. This time the stu student has put in the inverted commas. Research over the past two decades has elucidated more information about, that's the student's own, the complex pathobiology of spinal cord, blah, 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 up to that, that's the student's own, that this is not plagiarism, but it's an awful essay. <laughs> so uh, if it, it, you won't get failed for plagiarism, but you certainly won't get more than 40-something. So, actually, I, I mean, you've you put in so much work and effort and paid thousands and tens of thousands of pounds to get here, I think really to make sure you get the good degree that you deserve, because if you didn't give a, get, deserve a good degree, then the university wouldn't have accepted you in the first place. We need to learn something different, how to read process your reading and write properly. Writing clearly and simply is better than plagiarising. Uh, only use words that are familiar to you, words that you know already. Extend your vocabulary by keeping a notebook writing new vocabulary in with the context in which it occurs but don't use it unless it's in your heart and soul because if you lose, use it incorrectly then uh, the reader might not understand or it just sounds like not good English. So you've really got to be able to use these words properly. Um, now, this is a good uh, guide. Write simply and clearly in your own words. Try talking through your work first, either, um, either with a small group of students, a study group, which is always good, with just one person. Just talk it through, because as you explain, you will start to be clearer in your own mind. The more you teach something, the clearer it becomes to you. So as you explain, that talking will inform your writing and help you to write more clearly and you will more naturally start to summarise. Again, simple vocabulary is better than using sophisticated vocabulary incorrectly, uh, like the misuse of elucidated and preceded. So we're going to change the focus away from uh, plagiarism and copying to learning to process your reading and learning to write well. I cannot um, uh, help you to do this in 30 minutes, but I can uh, tell you how it can be done. It's largely with practice, actually. Most plagiarism problems are reading and writing problems. You need to integrate your source material, include it, and you've got these two questions to ask yourself. Can you summarise the writer's arguments and conclusions? Can you summarise the essence, uh, the, the juice, as the Italians say, of the article the, or what you're reading? Can you summarise it and just tell it to a fellow medic clearly? How does it fit in with your own view? For example, 
you might be discussing different kinds of treatments and which one is more appropriate to use in a certain situation. And you might have decided that one of them is more appropriate than another. And then you read another article which says something you haven't thought of. So you're always thinking, how does this article or this new information fit in with what I've said already? And if you ask those two questions, that will be really helpful. Now, you need also to learn to express your critical viewpoint of your source material as you write, as you go along. And this is called writing in your own voice. Now, your, the beginning of your postgraduate study, I, I am English. Uh, my English is pretty good because my degree was in English language and literature. And I honestly felt I never really was able to read and write really quickly and do everything with it until I was in my postgraduate year, somewhere about the middle and it all clicked into place. Do you see what I'm saying? So you will, by practice, uh, get there. So it's not your own words, it's giving your own voice to your source material. Now, giving your own voice, you need to be able to introduce your quotations, if you're using direct quotations, with a statement that shows your opinion. Don't just plonk them down at the beginning of a sentence or even at the beginning of a paragraph. So, for example, you might say it was shown conclusively that spinal cord injury and then your quotation follows with the reference. Now, if I say it was shown conclusively, it's pretty clear that I agree with this viewpoint and I'm closing that matter down. I'm taking that as pretty well fact. But I might say something like this. Liskarten, 2015, recognises that periodontal disease cannot be cured, but maintains that it can be effectively controlled. Now, here, you're... You're hedging a little bit. You're using different language. You're saying it, he recognises this, but he does say that it can be effectively controlled. And there might be arguments over the second. There might even be arguments over the first. But I'm not a dentist. Um, now, notice that when you're writing, the focus of interest is usually at the beginning of the sentence. So, for example, if you began a sentence like that, you're more interested in the factual information than in the person who says it. You've still got to give the reference, but what is of interest to you and to your reader here is this information about spinal cord injury. If you begin with the name of the writer, then that would be more likely to be in the literature review because you're more interested in that person's research. So, um, in a report or dissertation, you'd put the finding first, and a literature review, you put the name of the researcher first. Uh, so there are all th kinds of things about structuring your sentences and paragraphs as well that make part of your own voice. <clears throat> now, expressing critical opinion through reporting verbs, language issues are involved in expressing critical opinions. Um, observe how reporting verbs, and these are just a few examples, explains, find, show, point out, argue, acknowledge, recognize, claim, indicate, suggest, you know, uh, demonstrates. All these are reporting verbs and they do indicate your point of view to some extent. So, notice how they are used in the journals that you read when you are using 
quotation, the, the writer is using quotations um, or information and make a note of them in a separate book so that you can use them meaningfully yourself in other occasions. A useful text of this is Jean Godfrey, How to Use Your Reading in Your Essays or Dissertations. Anything by this publisher is good. That is slightly weighted to, for people whose English, for whom English is not their native language, but not totally. Right, Learning Development Guides. You are part of an academic conversation. You are, you, when you're reading a journal article, you are reading it from the point of view of somebody who is talking to not just the writer of that article, but of all the research that has been written. It's a conversation, an academic conversation. You're um, not looking at every writer as God, uh, but you're taking part in this conversation. Now these, um, let's see if I can get to the link here. This is our website. Whoops, that's the whole website. I meant to go to the link for self-access resources, student producers. Here we are. Right. Now these are free downloads that you can find on our website. This is about writing and using sources effectively, thinking of referencing as participating in an academic conversation, integrating source material within your work, making other people's ideas count work for you. They're about three pages long, they're free downloads, they're written in a student-friendly manner by a member of Queen Mary's staff, one of our education learning development departments. So there's no excuse for not looking at them, okay? Right. Uh, this is uh, quite a good site. Again, this is more for people whose first language isn't English. But what uh, Andy uh, Gillett, uh, Gillett, I don't know how he pronounces himself, says about um, a sound academic practice, writing in your own voice, is this. It will always be assumed that the words or ideas are your own if you do not say otherwise. When the words or ideas are taken from another writer, you must make this clear. And this is particularly difficult when people are reading a source which has quoted another source. They sometimes look at their, let's say you're reading a writer who was writing in 2016 and he has quoted people who were writing in 2008. Be very careful uh, that you, when you are quoting the journal writer, that you are making clear that his opinions of the other source are his and not yours. Otherwise, it could come across as plagiarism. I hope I've made sense of that, but um, the main voice should be your own and it should be clear what your point of view is in relation to the essay or to the topic or essay question or dissertation. You've got to make that very clear. Sources of human help, there are three of them. And I hope you start wondering what the little owls and eggs are for. Um, the faculty liaison, liaison librarians, excellent people. Paula Funnell is the liaison librarian for the School of Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, these people will help you find source material for your research. Uh, you have a look for it yourself first, but if you're really stuck, then um, Paula and her team, it might be they will help you, it might be that there is a different keyword that you could put in the search engine. Now, I've often seen students and they've said, there is no research on my area. And I say, are you sure? especially if they're postgraduate, are you sure you're saying there's no research or is it that you haven't found it? Oh, well, and then they go to Paula or her team and they come up with it. Um, the Language Centre, 
based in Bancroft. Now they are primarily uh, for non-native speakers, but not only, they do do um, general courses on essay writing and dissertation writing and so on and critical thinking. And you will have had a talk by a member of the Language Centre. And then last but not least, there's ourselves, Learning Development. Uh, writing and Study Guidance, we're based in the Myland Library. We offer 50 minutes of one-to-one -one, um, appointments, one-to-one -one time. So you come with your issue, whatever it is. Um, we don't touch content, we can't. Uh, we deliberately don't, even if it's from my own subject or my colleagues, but we can tell you if you've made logical connections, we can answer your questions about structuring, referencing and so on, and also help you with other areas like oral presentations. Um, now, one-to-one -one tutorials, strictly bookable, a week in advance. We start all our services the first week in October. Um, but you should be able to book from next week. And the incubator. These eggs are waiting to hatch. Well, not quite because they're coloured Easter eggs. But um, this is... <laughs> the idea is that your reading puts... Your source material puts ideas into your brain it processes or incubates in your brain and then you hatch it onto a piece of paper. And you can rework what you've written because it's not written in stone. Now the incubator is like a, a mini retreat. It helps people, we, they, they, you need to come for at least an hour, you don't have to stay for the whole two. You need to bring a laptop with you and usually your source material and you have to think what do I want to do in this time? Rewrite my introduction, read this article and summarise it. What do I want to do in this time? Then you do it. And then we offer facilitation. If you haven't achieved the task, we look at what is stopping you. If you have achieved it, then it has helped you to concentrate. And um, we offer these for a full day in the summer term when people are doing their dissertations. Uh, but right now we offer them for two hours a week to help people meet deadlines and uh, facilitate. But they're different from the tutorials because you're doing your independent work with facilitation in the incubator. Um, right. Oh, reference systems. Goodness, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are two main types. There's the numeric, which is Vancouver or Sh Chicago. And there's the author date system, which is Harvard, MLA, APA. Now, these are usually taken from the names of, for example, Modern Languages Association, uh, the, na the style, the way a particular journal um, references in a subject. Numeric is simply uh, footnotes at the bottom of the page or, or at the end of the chapter. And Harvard is uh, in text and the full, uh, the source is given briefly in the body of the writing and it's given in full at the reference list at the very end. Now, you will be very pleased to know that this year uh, Queen Mary ha has uh, streamlined its referencing for undergraduates. I don't think its systems apply to postgraduates. Do you know, George, do you know whether they have to use a particular style or which one it is? Um, I think the, the, the message has been it's one or the other providing there's consistency. Pardon? Sorry? There's one or the other providing there's consistency. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, if you're in any doubt, it comes from your department because different departments use different styles. Um, so w which, whether you use Harvard or uh, um, Vancouver, 
is is usually dictated by your supervisor, but which style of Harvard you use is um, uh, different. Okay, now referencing questions that people have. How do I find, how do I reference information that I found in a website, a blog, a conference paper, a radio interview, a video clip, a lecture? If I've said something that's original to me, I want you to reference me. A newspaper without a journalist's name, a table of statistics, uh, someone else's PhD thesis. Now, these are all questions people want to know when they're referencing. Uh, As uh, George says, uh, referencing pitfalls, consistency is key. Do you put and in words or do you do it like that? Do you put second ed or do you do it like that? Do you put et al after more than three authors or after more than six? Do you put Wilmot Ian or Wilmot I? Now, basically, whatever you do, you need to be consistent. Don't do it that way one time and that another time because it will be spotted. I've got eyes like an eagle when I see anything like that. It jumps out of the page. You must be consistent, but um, you, there, there, are, there are ways, once you know uh, which referencing style your department is using. I mentioned uh, secondary referencing before and I'm going to mention it again because here you're quoting a source found in another source. For example, a study by Wing Lee and Chen, 1994, cited by McKechnie, 1998, or in McKechnie, discussed sleep paralysis in the Chinese. Now, if you've read McKechnie but you haven't read these people, you must say that this is where you found the information. That's how it would appear in your reference list. But at postgraduate level, if you read this and this person refers to these, really, if you can, you should go back to the original source. But even if you don't go back to the original source, whatever you do, don't pretend you've read the original if you haven't. Say that you've read it in McKechnie or it will lead to plagiarism problems. Another pitfall, uh, which is the surname? Uh, you usually put the surname first. But is it Michael George or George Michael? Is it James Francis or Francis James? Even if you are a native speaker, this can give you problems, but you've got to do it right. Now, where can you find help on referencing? You can find the answers to all your questions, how you reference something, and also all the pitfalls in this particular book called Cite Them Right. But you don't have to buy it. You can see it in the study skills uh, section of the teaching collection in the Mile End Library. You can get the copy there for free. Uh, that the teaching collection, which has all kinds of useful books, and the ones I recommend, I'm I will write to the library and make sure they get copies. Um, if you, you can't find it and the librarian can't find it, then you fill in a request card because the more requests the library gets for a book, the more they'll buy extra copies. If you don't request something, they'll think you don't need it. <coughs> Anything by Palgrave Macmillan is a good book. Now, you don't even have to go up to Mile End because this year Queen Mary has spent an enormous amount of money by paying all the royalties 
to the publisher and getting Cite Them Right online. So it is available to any Queen Mary student and it answers all your questions about referencing. And this is the link to the library website where you can find it. The library has also written an inline, online interactive tutorial called Find It, Use It, Reference It. You can plug in at any area and you have headphones on and it's got a voice guiding you through. So you've got that resource as well. And on the library webpage you have citation managers, EndNote, Mendeley and Zotero. I know that the one preferred in the medical school is EndNote. You key in um, all the information about your reference, you key in the system that you want to use and it does it for you. It just rearranges everything for you in the right format. Um, so again, if there is any doubt about which referencing style to use, then ask your department, look in your handbook, ask your supervisor, uh, but the chances are they'll say it doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Finally, remember that your subject tutors, the library staff, the language centre, learning development, even the Turnitin website th itself are here to succeed, not to punish you or fail you. Self-interest would prevent that. Uh, it's not good for Queen Mary's reputa re reputation. But everybody wants you to do well and believes you can. So if you get a high similarity score on Turnitin, or if you are not sure if you have plagiarised, don't just sit there worrying and having nightmares. Ask someone for help. And the best time to start working on your reading and writing is now.